What's up, El Paso? Welcome back to this week's episode. Um, I have a very special episode for you, as you can tell. I'm not at Star City Studios as usual. I'm here at the DA's office, actually. So I'm here with DA Higgs. I'm super excited to be here. We're going to talk about some community efforts that they have going on and some other things. So please stay tuned from start to finish. Um, and if you guys have any questions, ask in the comments and we'll see if we can get them answered for you. Okay. So without further ado, let me go on and turn the camera around and introduce you to DA Higgs. There you are. All right. How are you doing today? Mr. Good morning. Hicks. I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for joining me. I am super excited to be here. Um, I've been wanting to have you on my podcast for a while. So this is exciting for me. Um, is there anything that you'd like to start off with before I kind of dive into some questions that we have for you? No, I'm very excited to have you here. I'm always excited to talk to anyone in our community and especially our uh, citizen reporters or citizen community. Yeah. I believe very much in, in transparency from our office. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here and let's let's get started. Let's All answer right. some questions. All right. I'm excited. So first off, I wanted to kind of, um, of course, with Annie's Adventures, I like to educate the community on different local businesses and of course, really everything going on in the city. So um, for myself and everybody at home who may not be aware, can you kind of explain what exactly does the DA and DA office do? So a lot of people don't understand because in the state of Texas, we're a little different than like the federal system. So in the federal system, you hear that the attorney general is the top cop for law enforcement, mm -hmm. right? And, and everything goes to the U.S. attorney general and, and he's kind of the head of the criminal justice system for the federal government. In Texas, the Texas attorney general is not the top cop. The Texas Attorney General is only the top civil law enforcement official for the state of Texas. In Texas, we have a very diffuse system when it comes to our criminal justice system. Your top cop for the criminal justice system is your district attorney's mm -hmm, office. Mm -hmm. So in Texas, we have you know, 156, 158 different district attorney's offices spread out throughout the, the, the state, state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And the district attorney's office is the top law enforcement official, the final say-so for what is and is not going to be prosecuted in each criminal district. Mm -hmm. So for El Paso, we have the 34th Judicial District. I have El Paso, Hudspeth, and Culberson counties. <clears throat> in those three counties, my office alone decides what will and will not be prosecuted. The police, the law enforcement officials can go and make whatever arrest they, they think is appropriate. But when it comes to what is and is not going to be filed in court, that's up to the district attorney's office. So I, of course, set the policy for my office. It's one district attorney and then however many assistants. In this case, we have 93 oh, assistant wow. district attorneys in our office. Okay. Uh, we're, we're budgeted for that many. We actually are <clears throat> about 76, 77 assistance right now. So uh, our office sets the policy and makes those decisions on what is and is not going to be filed in court. For example, the police department may arrest someone for burglary of a habitation, and we look at the case and we decide, well, that's really more of a criminal trespass. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Or the opposite may be true. The police may arrest someone for criminal trespass, and we look at it and think, this case really should be a burglary. Right, right. Uh, we see that a lot more often on DWIs. The police will arrest someone for DWI. And when we look at it, we decide, oh, this case really is a DWI third. So we file it as a felony. Uh -huh. That's much more common. Right. But anyway, you get the point. We make those final decisions. So your district attorney's office is the final decision maker on what is and is not going to be prosecuted mm -hmm. in whatever criminal, in whatever jurisdiction we're in. It's a very important office. And it's really the holder of our community when it comes to setting the standard and holding criminals accountable mm -hmm. and therefore holding up our criminal justice system. Right, right. Wow. And what I do want to encourage is that you guys have an active um, social media account that I've been following, mm -hmm. Instagram, um, where I see a lot of your all's news updates. So you guys have your initiatives on there as well to help educate the community, but you also are are doing your updates as well, your court updates, which is pretty mm -hmm. neat. Um, it's very educational as well. And it's just great to know what's happening in your community in and around you. Um, so I encourage you guys, uh, how do, how, it's just El Paso District Attorney 
I believe, on Instagram. So go and follow that. Please do. Please do. And, and again, you know, we're trying to even get better at doing this mm -hmm. and trying to, to get better at, at informing the public of what's happening in our community. I think that that's, that information sharing is, is key and communication is key, especially in our modern age where everything is in social media. But I think it's very important that we put out as much information as we can to help educate our public on what's happening in our court system, mm -hmm. because our court system is our court system. A hundred percent. And the public needs to know. Yes. Thank you for saying that. I love that. So, so real quick, I, I want to jump into some of your community efforts that you guys have going on. We have Justice for Juniors, Pick Your Ride, Teen Threats. We also have an upcoming Crimes Victims Walk, which is really interesting I want to talk about, and your truancy program. Like, this is excellent news for the city. And so I just want to talk, go through all of them, if you don't mind, and, and educate the community on what each one is. I'd be glad to talk about all of them. Okay. I want to start off by saying that <clears throat> when I came into office, I was um, having to rebuild a lot of what the district attorney's office does mm -hmm. because the, we, we took over from a, just a very disastrous situation mm -hmm. after two years of the Yvonne of Rosales administration. So we, we were really focused so much, especially in the first year of, of rebuilding and putting back in place the, the structure of the office right. and the administrative safeguards that needed to be in place. So we really are just now getting back into the groove of doing the community outreach that I think is so critically important. Mm -hmm. So while we have a lot of great programs in place, it's really just the beginning of my vision for what the district attorney's office should be doing yeah. in the public and to with the public with our community outreach. Mm -hmm. So we have some great programs and I'd love to talk about them, but I, I just want to, to couch it with the, with the understanding that this is just the beginning yes. of things that I think that our office should be doing with the public. Absolutely. And that's great that you said that because, uh, again, you, you came in and you had to reorganize things. And that's oh, not typically the case, but that stuff takes time. And when you're in an office like the DA office, like you got to be very, very thorough and careful with putting it back together. Yeah. It's so very true. We have a total of 220 employees, a budget of $33 million. A combined budget includes our general fund and our grants. And that's a lot of work to try to reorganize and build back in those uh, community safeguards, those structural safeguards, administrative safeguards that really had been kind of set aside mm -hmm. in just two years of the Rosales administration. So it's taken a lot to rebuild the office. And, and we're not done yet. Sure. There's still things that need to be done. But we're getting to the point now where we're in a position to start doing even more community outreach. I'm really proud of the programs that we've started, but we're we're, we're starting even more programs. Yeah. So I'm really proud of that. Well, I only knew about three of them. And then when I got in here today, I learned about two others. I'm like, yes, this mm -hmm. is what we need. So I'm excited to go over it and share it with the community. Let's get started. All right. Let's start with Justice for Kids, J4J. Justice, Justice for, for Juniors. Juniors. My bad. There Justice for Juniors. It's for kids. Yeah, it is. So this is a brand new program. It's never been done before in any prior administration. This is uh, something that we started in, in my administration. And it's really designed to start empowering our the youth that we have, our kids in our mm -hmm. community, to let them know that if something has happened to them, if they've been bullied or if they've been abused either physically or, or even sexually, that they need to understand that they have a voice. Mm -hmm. They have somebody who understands them and who's backing them up and who's there for them. You know, <clears throat> unfortunately, so many times a, a sexual abuser will tell that child, hey, I'm the authority figure. Mm -hmm. I am the person uh, who's in charge here. And if you say anything, who are they going to believe? You, the little kid, mm -hmm. or me, the authority figure? Mm -hmm. And, and that's why our children are, are so often sexually abused and don't make that outcry until years and years later. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get the message across to our kids, that's not true. That's just not true. If something has happened to you, say something. Yes. Go talk to a teacher. Go talk to a police officer. Go talk to a, a school principal. Go talk to someone you trust because it, it you are going to be believed. And we make that message that our entire community is standing behind you. We've had our, our Justice for Juniors, our J4J, for J in, in Socorro and in, in Horizon. And in both events, we've had community leaders, community councilmen, mayors. We've had uh, law enforcement, firefighters. We've had so many community 
visible community people come out and stand with us, as well as, of course, people from our office and other community leaders standing out there to stand up to say and make that visible imagery that the community stands behind our just our right. juniors. Right. And to make that imagery that, you know, if, if something has happened, come get your justice because we're all standing here for you. Yes, that is so important. I love that so much. And you guys, and, and from what I read, it's... Um, it's an activity, like it's an event. It's, yeah, or? it's a, such a fun-filled day. So, of course, it's it's in July. It's in the end, end of July. It's kind of targeted to get us right before we go back into school. Perfect. We do like get backpack giveaways. Okay. Uh, thanks for call me Abel, who provided a lot of those backpacks, all the backpacks. <laughs> um, a lot of our partners that we we partner with are are very instrumental in making this event happen. But we gave backpack giveaways, and so it's it's just. But it's really hot outside, right? Right. So we did a, a water gun fight with That's law cute. enforcement. So we have uh, police officers out there partnering with the kids, and they have water gun fights and water balloon fights. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, this this year, the Horizon uh, Fire Department decided that they wanted to show everyone they had the biggest water gun. Oh, so that's awesome! Out, <laughs> they got out there with their big uh, the the ladder gun, the ladder uh, sure. truck, and and started spraying the whole field down with oh, water. That's crazy! That's uh, awesome. Which was just so much fun. Yeah. Everyone had so much fun. That's and it's it's perfect for all ages. It is. Yeah, it is. It, we it, had. Little kids, little toddlers, all the way up to teenagers out there running and playing Beautiful. in the water. Uh, it was just a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So this, the next one will happen in the summer as well, prior yes. to school? Perfect. And and again, they can follow your page to get more information. Absolutely. On okay, excellent. So then next we also have your Pick Your Ride, mm -hmm. which, man, when I saw that, Mr. Higgs, I just went crazy. I was like, finally. I was, I was telling them earlier, like, for me personally, after COVID, I feel like El Paso is just a completely different beast. Um, I don't feel safe driving on the roads past 10 p.m. personally. Um, and, you know, everybody follows it down. That's where I follow to see my traffic, my weather, and all that. And there's just so many accidents happening. Unnecessary. Uh, so incredibly unnecessary. I feel like this town needs to go back to defensive driving and also <laughs> probably um, maybe some anger management classes or something to handle this um drinking problem that we have um to find other outlets to handle their emotions and state to me i i myself have two dwis i don't drink anymore because i used to live in austin i no longer drink 15 years sober um congratulations well thank you so much but but that being said you know i learned my lesson mm -hmm. i i touched the stove twice and i know it's hot i am not touching that stove again um and it's difficult you know and 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 growing up in a community like this where it's family and parties and quinceaneras and parties mm -hmm. all the time it's just very much part of the com the culture kind mm -hmm. of um and so trying to help people like you don't have to drink and drive so finally there's a program here where you know everybody has the option to call uber but you're giving people like no excuses. There are no excuses why not to call Uber when you're giving them a free voucher to get them home safe, make sure they're safe and everyone around them is safe. Because I feel like even through school zones, they're not thinking about anybody but themselves just to get to that destination 10 seconds sooner. It's really not that much of a difference when they're speeding to get there faster. So it's 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 just baffles me. Well, everyone's in a hurry to get to the next red light. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's the, uh, so <clears throat> obviously a large part of what we do is, is take cases and prosecute them in court, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all what, what we're doing on the back end after someone has been caught with a DWI and we're looking at what is the right punishment. Uh, sometimes that's, uh, counseling to try to get, to address alcoholism, uh, to try to get people to, to face their alcoholism, to face what they're doing mm -hmm. to get them structured and, and rehabilitated. Sometimes it's just uh, you got to bring the hammer and hit them over the head. So mm -hmm. there's there's all kinds of different ways to approach mm -hmm. what is justice in a DWI case. In in looking at that and in looking at all of the the rise in DWI cases and, and intoxicated cases that we were seeing coming out of COVID, it it was just shocking and frustrating 100%. that you know we were we we're putting out the message that hey 
you know, we're putting people in prison for DWI. We had people that were committing DWI third and intoxicated manslaughter that we were indicting now as a felony murder case. So wow. we have people facing five to 99 or life for driving while intoxicated on their third case while and then committing a so intoxicated life manslaughter. So life-changing. You know, and you we're know? putting that out and that's not saying that message is not getting out. It's not making any kind of impact. So we decided, well, we need to do something proactive. Mm -hmm. So we did. Mm -hmm. We 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 applied for a grant from TxDOT. We got this grant, uh, about fifty thousand dollars, forty five thousand dollars, and we started applying that out. Okay, we're going to parse that out over the year into uh, weekends and and start giving people a free ride. Let's see if we can prevent the DWI in the first place. Yes. And it turns out that our twenty dollar voucher is more than enough. Our average voucher usage is somewhere between 13 to $16. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> very, very few people are using the full $20. Mm -hmm. So 13 to $16 is getting people home. Mm -hmm. um, where uh, the, the amount that we have set aside every weekend is getting used every weekend, but we had to parse it out the 50,000 over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. and. Unfortunately, we didn't have unlimited funds because sure. that's just the nature of grants. We don't have right. unlimited funds, but we used all 50000 throughout the course of the year. All the money was spent, and we applied for another grant, and we'll be doing it again next year. All right. So Look upon we're, from that. <laughs> we're very proud of the fact that we're trying to get people home safely. Yes. So I look at the you know 2,000 some odd people that use the voucher as 2,000 people that did not drive drunk. And that's what I was going to ask you about how 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 often was it being used and how, how, your totals more or less. On... Yeah since we just came out of the fiscal year I don't have the totals right now mm -hmm. I should have gotten that for you oh, but it's fine. We're, we're a little over 2,000 people wow. use the vouchers so that's a little over 2,000 people that did not drive drunk, a little over 2,000 people that did not get in an accident, a little over 2,000 people that did not hurt, harm, or kill another person because of their intoxication. That's a big deal. So that is a big deal. Yeah. And I look at that as being a really a positive impact on our community. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, being a district attorney is a unique job because we're actually in the business of trying to put ourselves out of business, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and that would be great. If we had no crime, that would be a perfect scenario. Sure. Unfortunately, that's just never going to be the case. But if we can eliminate 2,000 DWIs, that's a great thing. Yeah. So we're going to keep doing the DWI program. We're going to keep doing the vouchers next year. Beautiful. And hopefully we can eliminate another 2,000 or more DWIs next year. I love it. And El Paso, this is super important, whether it's for you or someone else. Everybody needs to know about this program. Um, I, I think that's so incredibly, like I mentioned, it's a huge deal. Two, mm -hmm. two, how many? 20,000? 2,000. Vouchers 2,000 used, vouchers. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's insane. Just those people would have been driving home. Yeah. Yeah. Simply put. Thank thank you. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, so let's move on to teen threats. Um, I saw this video. I'm telling you, you guys are like rock stars to me on your all's Instagram. I'm like, oh, my gosh, finally, this is happening. And and with the kids, especially, there's been a lot of teenage um issues i don't know how to say it uh lately within the last couple of years um these kids are different <laughs> you know um and people at home are wondering where are the parents what's happening here and so um tell us about the teen threats i was incredibly impressed with that video and i shared it right away and mm -hmm. it's a message that is is very important for people to know about yeah so it's it's gun threats bomb threats school threats are no joke mm -hmm. and it's a great message uh, unfortunately, the day that we released the video was the same day that, there, that the uh, school shooting happened in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Just bad circumstances. Uh, statistics show that every time there is a school shooting, copycat bomb threats and school threats, gun threats, um, jump up. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult for us to say whether or not our video had an impact to lessen the spike mm -hmm. in in gun threats or, or bomb yeah. threats in schools. It's very hard to tell. It's very hard to tell, 100%. 100%. There's always a spike, so hopefully we lessened that spike. And there's always that spike, of course, <laughs> has a curve to it, and hopefully we shortened the curve. 
but it's hard to tell. It's very hard to tell and to prove the negative. But the bottom line is, all throughout the last year, I saw so many gun threats and bomb threats interrupting classwork. Oh I'm getting complaints from teachers. You know, how can I teach my class when you know every week? Or I was going to say it week, seemed like a weekly thing. Every week, every other week, my class is getting interrupted because we have a bomb threat or a gun threat in our school. And, you know, it's not fair to the teachers. It's not fair to the students. And every week it's happening. Mm -hmm. our, our law enforcement has to take every single one of them seriously because you never know you when never the know. next one's going to be a, mm -hmm. a Georgia situation. Mm -hmm. You never know. So our law enforcement takes every one of them very seriously. They approach the school. They lock down the school. They do the searches. They do the, then, they, then on the background, the FBI comes in. Wow. They do the background investigation to try to track down who made the threat. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were, unfortunately, there were even threats being made to schools across the country coming from outside of the country. So, you know, I, I don't understand why international terrorism feels that it's appropriate to make bomb threats or gun threats across the country to our school districts. Wow. What, what they hope to gain from that, I don't understand. But we've seen that happen. Uh, so the FBI is, you know, reporting back that this is a hoax threat. It's coming across. Yeah. It's you know, like it's a coming spamming from, kind of thing. It's from, insane. From outside of the country. Uh, but then we have, you know, so not only are we having to deal with our own homegrown problems, right. we're getting it from outside the country as right. well. It's crazy. But we're seeing that happen so much last year that I said, you know, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. Mm -hmm. The district attorney's office does not prosecute juveniles. The county attorney's office does. So I said, but I, I, you know, I just can't sit back and not do something. I, I have a son. My mm -hmm. son is in school. So I didn't, you know, I'm hearing from teachers. My son's in school. I can't, I just can't, not I gotta, can't sit back and not do anything. Right. So we sat down and we started brainstorming. Last year, uh, the FBI put up a poster that we helped participate in mm -hmm. about school threats or are going to get prosecuted, investigated and prosecuted. The, the billboards went up around the city, and I thought, you know, that's really a great idea, but the problem is, what are kids doing when they drive by billboards, right? Here, here's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Zombies. Because <laughs> they're not the ones looking, you know, out the door. If there's a passenger in the car, they have their phones in front of them. They're not. They're, they're not, not driving, looking. They're not. They're not looking out at billboards, right? Right. And the message needed to get to the kids. Mm -hmm. So I thought we need to do a video that's going to be delivered directly to the kids, mm -hmm. directly to our high school students and junior high students. Mm -hmm. And so then we started talking about you know what kind of video we need. We brought in the chiefs of police from all the school districts. We brought in the FBI. And we talked about what kind of video do we need. <clears throat> and of course we had this like five minute long video that was going to be great. And then we talked to some film people, film professional film, mm -hmm. film, film photographers. What? I don't know the term, the filmmakers. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh, you can't do a five minute video. You got to do a 30 second, 30 video. Second 30 less. second video. Yeah. Right. And we're like, no, we got five minutes worth of material. <laughs> this is going to be a great video. So they, they came to us. So we pared everything down. We worked it up and, and came up with a script and, and going through the whole process. Mm -hmm. It was like a nine thousand dollar production. Yeah. The the video people were so generous; they donated all of their time. We only had to pay for the cost. Wow! Um, the our office it was a paid community for, effort. It here. really was. Yeah. Our office paid for it, but the law enforcement participated. All of the chiefs of police, all the school districts participated. The FBI participated. We came up with a what I think is a really good professional yes. video. That we've now delivered impactful. to impactful. Impactful. We've now delivered to all the school districts, and it's online and can be accessed online. So they're playing this video in schools. They played it at all the schools and delivered to all the students in all of the school districts in El Paso County. That's awesome. Very and cool. we're we hope to deliver it again at the beginning of each semester. That's great. Yeah, I mean it's something they have to keep hearing right until they mm -hmm. it gets in there. Um, well, the the message is: look, if you make these threats. Even if you're joking, if you make these threats, you're looking at going to prison for up to 10 years. Wow. Up to 10 years. And they don't realize. Yeah, some of them are just singing. It's not a joke. It, it's you may not. You may be intending it to be a joke, but it's not. It's a very serious business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hee hee ha ha. But the problem is that you're going to get charged with a felony. 
And if you're 17 years or older, even if you're a junior in high school, you're 17 years old, you're getting slapped with a felony. You're getting arrested with a felony that's going to follow you for the rest of your life. Wow. The rest it's of your life. No joking matter. It is no joke. School mm -hmm. threats are no joke. Yeah, it. Th there's no place for it. But it, I mean, but children, you know, it just it's it's bothersome. I can only imagine. I don't have kids. I can only imagine. You know, I have lots of nieces yeah. and nephews that go to school, and every time we're we're families are texting. Have you heard from the kids? Are they mm -hmm. okay? That's the regular occurrence. It just mm -hmm. no need for. It. We never had that issue before here. Mm -hmm. You know, and so why the speed the the peak? I don't know. It's probably a deeper thing, something that needs to be addressed at home, which is why I'm really excited to hear about this uh, truancy program you're working on. So early in um, early in my administration, after coming back into office, uh, I started hearing from the justice of the peace and the different school districts that our truancy problem was very hodgepodge, mm -hmm. that, that we had different enforcement from different JPs and different school districts were kind of um, approaching truancy very differently. Mm -hmm. And that that's a problem yes. because we, in our county, we need to be very uniform in how we're approaching truancy. Mm -hmm. our, the district attorney's office is responsible for prosecuting in all of our justices of the peace offices. So it ultimately comes down to our office to make sure that we're uniform in how we're prosecuting truancy cases. So uh, it, it, we had a truancy program uh, back, this this goes back to when I was an assistant district attorney. Okay. Uh, and I was here from uh, 1998 through 2010. Mm -hmm. So back at that point, we did have a truancy program. I was, when I was a supervisor over the JPs, uh, we, I, I knew about the truancy program, I was a participant in it. So I thought, you know, we need to go back and, and have a unified truancy program. So I got together our, our, people in our office that supervise and that, that had worked on a truancy program to start working on a truancy program again to get a unified, cohesive truancy program. We started talking to our JPs. The JPs were, were great. They all jumped in and said, yes, this is good. We need uniformity. The school district said that, you know, well, this, is, this is probably a very good thing. We yes. need uniformity. So we got great collaboration from our JPs and our school districts. We put together the truancy program, which now we have uniformed uh, truancy across the all school districts and across the county. That's great. So if a, a parent starts having a truancy issue with this school district, they can't just transfer it to another school district. That was happening? It was happening. I can imagine. Parents started having truancy issues. They transferred to another school district, and oh, now it's all leniency, no big deal. Rather than fix the problem, yeah, right? Yeah. Have everybody where fixing. are they getting? Like, where are these kids getting this stuff from? Yeah. Like, geez, I don't know. Yeah. And so they, and, or you know, they're having. So they, that was just ridiculous. Some yeah. of the, some of the things we were hearing uh, that the parents were getting away sense. with, yeah. and and the kids were getting away with. So. We, we fixed it. There's now a very uniform approach to truancy. Great. And it's, um, you, can't, you can't play games with yes. truancy. And our emphasis is to get the kids back into classrooms, back into school. Let me tell you, time and again, when we're prosecuting cases, mm -hmm. the number one thing we see in all of our criminal cases is that the person who's being prosecuted does not have a high school degree, no high school diploma. Their dropouts. Mm. If they get a high school diploma or at least a GED, they are statistically much, much less likely to get a, involved with criminal activity. Sure. sure. So, knowing that, it is very important to me that we have this uniform truancy program to get our kids back into school. Yes. Just get them back into school. It's not about going to college. It's not about let's get them into a vocational program. It's get them into school through that high school diploma or GED. Mm -hmm. Because statistically, and I don't understand the magic, but statistically, they are much, much less likely to get involved in our criminal justice program. Sure. And again, I'm in the business of trying to put myself out of business. <laughs> and if we can cut down on the crime rate, then let's do it. Yes. I, lo I love that. So uh, thank you so much for that information because I just barely found out about that today. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to talk about your upcoming Crime Victims Walk happening in October. <clears throat> well, so 
so much of our criminal justice system, in fact, the entire criminal justice system, is really geared towards protecting the rights of the defendant. And, and that's fair. I mean, it should be. We don't want to uh, put an innocent person into prison, right? So the criminal justice system is designed to protect the rights of the defendant. Mm -hmm. And as you go through the criminal justice system, uh, a case is prosecuted all the way through trial, through the whole way through. Everything is designed around protecting the defendant. And um, the, the burden of proof, just everything, the rights, everything. Well, through that process, the victim of crime kind of gets forgotten and pushed aside. Mm -hmm. And the only one who really stands up for the victim of crime is the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. The only one who stands up and says, hey, wait a minute. Someone was victimized here. Let's talk about this person. Mm -hmm. Let's give voice to the person who has no voice in the criminal justice system. Yeah, the whole reason why we're here. The whole reason we're here. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this person who who has no voice in the system. It's the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jaime Esparza started many years ago, the Crime Victims Walk. It went away with Ms. Rosales and we brought it back. Because I think it's very, very important that we emphasize and empower our crime victims. I think it's very important that we stand up and remind the community how important standing up for crime victims truly is. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to empower our crime victims to, to have an opportunity to gather together, to network, to be, um, to be together and to know that our office remembers them, our office stands for them and to tell the community, hey, crime victims are important. Mm -hmm. Crime victims matter, and crime victims are why we do our job to seek justice. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's a very important thing that we do this crime victims walk. I'm very proud of doing this walk. I'm very proud of heading it up. It has always been, uh, from the decades that Jaime Esparza did the walk, it's always been in October, so I'm very proud to continue that tradition. Mm -hmm. We'll have it the last weekend of October. Oh, great. And um, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm a little leery because it's five miles. and You got I'm not, this. not sure my old legs are you going to be up for this. it. But <laughs> um, and, and how do people register or sign up? How does this work? Like, if they, can, Is it open to everybody? Or to it is support? absolutely open to everybody. Absolutely open to everybody. Uh, so we do have the sign-up the the uh, sheet on or the link mm -hmm. online on our social media pages okay. uh, so they can certainly jump online to to sign up mm -hmm. it's a five mile walk uh, but it's uh, but we're looking forward to it and it is going to be a, a great event yeah. it's a very important event to stand up and and uh, acknowledge that uh, we're standing up for the victims of crime we'll have a lot of law enforcement officials out there we're going to have of course a lot of public officials out there and uh, and a lot of uh, victims of crime out there as well i love this i love so much what you're doing for our community and bringing these initiatives back or just starting them from mm -hmm. the get-go because we need this we need all of this and we need more and just like you said you guys are just getting started so i want to thank you for 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 what you guys are doing for our community I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me take this back because there is one other I wanted to ask about prior. Mm -hmm. The Chuco Tango. Everybody's sure. going crazy over this. Like, how is this happening? For what? First off, I'm going to tell you, I saw that video online and I right away I was like, that's the Gateway Hotel. Like, that's a Gateway Motel. Or get a, gate, Gateway? Is it called the Gateway? Yeah. I knew right away which one it was. You know, I've mm -hmm. never been in mm -hmm. it, but I've walked past it and you could just. It was like I couldn't understand like where else it would be. Um, so that was very interesting, scary, um, shocking. What's happening here with we know there's a lot of um, migration happening and all, but how is this happening? Like what is happening and is this just here? Is there other I'm sure there's other gangs like is there anything we need to know about community? Keep your head on a swivel. See something, say something. Please let us know about this area. Well, the the I think the gang you're referring to is the Tren de Aragua. Okay. The the um, the Venezuelan gang. Yes. Not the 
um, Chuco Tango. So what's the difference? Why I'm getting this confused, obviously, mm -hmm. and that just means that this is, there is something very obviously happening here that we should have on the table and talk about in our right. community. So we actually have a, a variety of, of criminal gangs uh, that that frequent our community. Okay. Um, Chuco Tango is a um, gang, uh, criminal gang that, that has uh, been in existence for a long time. Uh, they're well known to the criminal justice system. They exist in our criminal uh, gang database. Um, we uh, are known, they are known to us and we are familiar with them. Mm -hmm. uh, they have recently, uh, the federal government, Jaime Esparza, our, our U.S. attorney, uh, recently headed up a gang roundup of, or warrant roundup. Mm -hmm. uh, our office participated in right. that, uh, rounding up uh, indictments that had been passed down on, on various Chuco Tango gang members. Okay. Uh, we participated. There were several warrants that were issued for state uh, offenses as well, a variety of federal offenses. Wow. So a large number of Chuco Tango gang members were rounded up and, and are now facing both federal charges and state charges. So there are a lot of Chuco Tango gang members who are no longer on the streets. Yes. Uh, as of as of a couple of weeks ago. And, and so these gangs that were were they already here? So those gangs have already been here. Okay. Those aren't as a result of migration. We just hear about them or know about them. Well, as far as the community. Yeah. You we, guys, of heard. course. But as far as... Like, you may have heard of the Barrio Azteca yes. gang members, yes. right? So Barrio Azteca was a very prevalent gang for mm -hmm. many, many years. Mm -hmm. They were a very controlling mm -hmm. gang. Through a series of arrests, uh, headed up mainly by the FBI, but a series of arrests, certainly our, our local gang task force uh, participated very, uh, very actively with those yes. arrests. The Barrio Azteca gang members have been um, greatly diminished in their um, authority, their power in okay. El Paso. Okay. They still exist. There are still Barrio Azteca gang members, mm -hmm. and there is still Barrio Azteca gang activity in El Paso. But their authority, their power has been greatly diminished as a result of, of some very zealous and aggressive prosecutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, investigations that led to those prosecutions over the past five years or so. So I'm very proud of those uh, that work that was done uh, by law enforcement. Yeah. But that's a that's an example of a street gang, criminal gang that that was um, you might have heard of that has existed for a long time. Right. That's not as prevalent anymore. So Chuco Tango is just kind of the latest in that series of okay. of, of criminal gangs that. That is, becomes well known in El Paso, and and then becomes the target of investigation, and and then eventually fades away, or, or becomes much less prevalent because of the target of investigation. The law enforcement goes after them, takes out their leadership and their mid-level leaders, and <clears throat> they become less well known. Can you touch a little bit on the activity, the gang activities that? Is it different throughout the different gangs? or TDA uh, is different than the gangs like Chuco Tango and, and Barrio Azteca. Barrio Azteca and Chuco, and Chuco Tango tend to be more oriented on uh, narcotics activity, um, some prostitution, but more narcotics okay. activity, um, gun running, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, TDA seems, seems to be more oriented uh, on human smuggling, mm. uh, human mm -hmm. trafficking. Um, Interesting. Prostitution, of course, is big, but, but human smuggling is, is really a, sure. <clears throat> a very big border. thing for, for, yeah, for TDA. Mm -hmm. So drugs comes along with that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just easy. It's a, it's a side byproduct, but uh, human smuggling is, is really the, 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 the mainstay of, of TDA. Okay. So... Awesome. And, and, of course, if anybody sees something, say something, reach out to authorities. Uh, absolutely. Anytime you see anything that looks suspicious to you, feel free to call Crime Stoppers and leave that tip, mm -hmm. that concern. <clears throat> it's it's anonymous, and um, if it leads to an arrest, it could actually lead to a cash reward for you. Oh, wow. Well, and, and, just, and, and I'd like to say that in general about, you know, 
there's a lot of activity going on in our community. Our town's getting bigger. That comes with big city problems, such as our traffic problems and, and gang activity and so forth. Um, I know there's a lot of, uh, there has been a lot of stash houses found within central El Paso and throughout El Paso. Um, and so same thing, if you see something out there and you're concerned or you think you may have some kind of idea what's happening, just report it and they'll go and check it out for you and, and you know if there's a bad situation going on you're at least helping the community by speaking out so is there anything else that you wanted to add to any of about any of those programs no about about the programs, programs no, and the, the gangs and safety and yeah so the um uh, the tda is a, a new thing that's really come along with the venezuelan migration okay um, the governor had made statements uh, about El Paso and the TDA migration, um, Venezuelan migration. And I think it's important to understand that um, uh, El Paso has been the um, center or has received the most Venezuelan migration uh, from any other Texas city or town. So more Venezuelans have migrated through El Paso than anywhere else. Oh, wow. As with all migrations, mm -hmm. uh, any ethnic group that has migrated through El Paso, the vast majority of the people, the vast, vast majority of people who, who come across the border do not stay in El Paso. Okay. They're here for a short period of time, sure. and then they go on to wherever their ultimate destination is. Right. So, and, and that's true for the Venezuelans who have come through as well. Mm -hmm. So while there are no doubt, TDA members embedded in the Venezuelans who have come across, the vast majority of those have, again, gone on to whatever destination mm -hmm. they've gone on to. Mm -hmm. We have seen some Venezuelans come back to El Paso. Mm -hmm. We can't confirm that those are TDA members or not, but some have come back to El Paso. We do have some Venezuelan TDA gang activity in El Paso. Mm -hmm. It is being investigated and it is now being targeted. The governor has raised the threat level of TDA to being a, a tier one level threat. So much like in the past, um, law enforcement has targeted Barrio Azteca, they've targeted Chucotengo, they will now target TDA. Mm. So. Uh, as far as our community being safe, I would say our community is a safe place and mm -hmm. will continue to be a safe place yes. because law enforcement will now target TDA the way they have targeted the other gangs in the past. Uh -huh. So as much as our community received a safest community designation, even when we had very high Barrio Azteca gang activity in our community, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I anticipate that we will continue to be a safe community even with TDA gang activity in our community. Right. So the presence of TDA gang activity does not equate to a dangerous community mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just as the presence <clears throat> of Barrio Azteca gang activity did not equate to a dangerous community. We right. still were a safe community and we will be a safe community 100%. either way. Right. But that doesn't mean that we should close our eyes and put on blinders. Mm -hmm. Always be aware of your surroundings. Always be aware of people that, that you know, should be, uh, look like they're up to something no good and always feel free to call Crime yes. Stoppers and drop that hint or that, that tip right. anytime. Absolutely. I love Crime Stoppers. I've had them on before, too. And, and, and I mean, honestly, our, our law enforcement is amazing here. Um, so just as, as safe as ever, but it's also very important um, and responsible to know about what's going on in, around you in your community. Um, I guess and, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a little bit about the trial and what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I have a three three parts but it's probably the same. So I'm just going to mm -hmm. read it and you answer it how you feel best. Um, it's my understanding that the federal government took the death penalty off the table, um, but Texas is still pursuing it. Um, how does that work? Why did the federal government choose not to seek the death penalty, um, but the state of Texas is? And then 
can you just explain the difference with what's happened between the federal trial and the state trial? So myself, and I'm sure if I have questions, others at home have questions and we can better understand what's happening. This is a very important matter in our community um, and it just means, it touches everybody at, at home. So um, let me go on and turn it like there you are. All right. Absolutely. So uh, from the very first day that I was sworn into office, mm -hmm. getting the Walmart case back on track was my number one priority. Yes. And it remains getting that case to trial remains my number one priority. So let me explain a few things. Um, since August of 2019, um, the Walmart shooter was indicted in October of 2019. He was showed up for arraignment in October of 2019 in state court. Shortly after that, the federal government came and borrowed him from state custody over to federal custody for prosecution in federal court. We have, in, in, our, in our system, we have a state government and a federal government, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we're separate sovereigns. And that means that a person can be prosecuted for a state crime and a federal crime. Mm -hmm. They're totally separate crimes or totally separate governments, and a person could be prosecuted in either state, federal court or state court or both courts. Okay. okay, okay. So just because possession of a drug is illegal in state court, it can also be illegal in federal court, mm -hmm. and a person could be prosecuted in both, both. courts okay. for that same right. offense. Right. It is not double jeopardy to be prosecuted by two different sovereigns for the same crime. Okay. It is double jeopardy to be prosecuted by the same sovereign twice, uh -huh. but not two different sovereigns. Okay. That, okay. Th well, that alone, geez, I just learned sure. a lot. Thank you. Okay, I understand. So the federal government and state government are two different sovereigns. Two different crimes can be prosecuted, or the same crime can be prosecuted twice. Two times. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Now, we have, um, so he's taken into federal custody to be prosecuted, essentially for the same crime, but it's a little different. He's prosecuted in federal court for a bunch of different counts for causing the death of someone, uh, I'm paraphrasing, causing the death of someone with a motive of hate, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so, and, and a bunch of different counts of that. Mm -hmm and then attempting to cause the death of someone with a motive of hate, and then using a gun to commit acts of hate. Mm -hmm. He, The federal government keeps him in their custody for a little over three years mm -hmm. while they go back and forth on whether or not they're going to seek the death penalty. Okay. The federal government has a committee that sits in Washington, D.C. that makes the decision on whether or not to seek the death penalty or not. I'm not a part of that committee, obviously. I'm, I'm a state prosecutor. But that federal committee makes that decision. It took them a long time to make the decision to not seek the death penalty. I do not know why they made that decision. On a very, very similar case in Pennsylvania, they made the decision to seek the death penalty. Wow. They made the decision to not seek the death penalty in this case, in, mm -hmm. the, in the Walmart case. And they don't say why? They, don't they do not issue a written opinion on why. That's interesting. They did, again, make a decision to seek the death penalty on a very similar case out of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Did not seek it on the Walmart case. Mm -hmm. but I Wait. do not know why. Sure. Once they made that decision to not seek the death penalty, then um, the attorneys for the Walmart shooter entered a plea agreement which uh, pled him guilty to all of the counts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that happened in January of 2023, and he was sentenced in July of 2023. Right. He was returned to state custody, because we said the federal government borrowed him. Yes, he had him He was returned to state custody in July, at the end of July in 2023. Okay. okay. The entire time he is in federal custody, he is, he is in federal custody. The state government cannot borrow him back to go to state court. Mm -hmm. So the federal government rents space in the county jail for federal inmates. The federal government does not have their own jail system, their okay. own pretrial detention jail system. Okay. 
They have their own prisons for after conviction, but before conviction, they don't have their own jail system. So they rent space in county jail for that. So he sat in the county jail for that whole time, but he was in federal custody. Hmm. Because he's in federal custody in that rented space, right. the state judge, Judge Madrano, could not pull him right. out of state custody and bring him over to state court. Not until it's done. Not until they were done with right. him. The law says that we cannot have any hearings that are of substance without having him in court. Right. So you have to wait. We have we to wait. had to wait mm-hmm. for almost four years wow. until he came back to state custody. Out of our hands. Out of our control. Nothing Com- we can do about that. It's just the way of the land. Completely out of our hands. Mm-hmm. The federal government was in control of the calendar. Okay. And they're the ones who are responsible for this four-year delay. 100%. Okay. So it was very frustrating. I understand that. Mm-hmm. But they're the ones who are responsible for the three and a half year delay okay. that that took us from you know uh, October of 2019 till July of 2023. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In July of 2023, he comes into state custody. We had our first hearing in court in September of 2023. That was the first status hearing that we had. Um, by December of 2023, I announced in court that the state of Texas was ready to go to trial. Mm-hmm. I followed up in January and again in February, the state of Texas is ready to go to trial. The defense has repeatedly said that they are not ready to go to trial, will never be ready to go to trial, at least for another two or three years. Um, It looks like the judge has given us a scheduling order that if you pan it out, it looks like we're looking at trial in 2026 now. Um, But It's a process. That's the process, yes. Whether we like it or not, we, we don't want to be here, but this is just how it goes. Yes. Um, and, and again, because it's our community, it just is. It is very, very frustrating. Yes. I understand that. Mm-hmm. It is very, very frustrating. Yeah. It has been five years. It'll be six years, and we're still Yeah, I mean, I lingering. can only under, I can only imagine how frustrated you guys must be um, and, and everybody in the state side trying to get this. Um, we, we literally have the case sitting on a shelf waiting because we are ready to go to trial right there's nothing that stops us we could start jury selection as soon as the judge says start jury selection we'd be ready okay now with any capital murder case not just walmart but any capital murder case there are hearings that have to happen before we start jury selection there's going to be things like a motion to suppress everybody hears about motion to suppress there's going to be a motion to suppress there'll probably be a couple of them There are going to be motions to determine what the experts can and cannot say. Uh, The defense recently filed a motion for additional discovery Mm -hmm. based on a bunch of different stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, All of that sort of thing has to be heard before we start jury selection. So there are going to be these hearings that have to happen. How soon those hearings happen is completely under the control of the judge. Okay. So the judge controls the calendar. Okay. The judge is the one who sets the dates for you will have all pretrial motions have to be filed by this date and he's issued a scheduling order so we now know when all that is that mm-hmm. you know all all pretrial motions have to be filed by this date. We're going to start having hearings on this date and we're going to go methodically and then all uh, we have to have our jury questionnaires by this date. And then we'll start actually asking for jurors to come in on this date. So that, you know, gives us the, 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 the schedule. I would imagine we are going to go through a lot of jurors to try to find a jury pool like here that. in El Paso. Right. It's, this, this case was very, very emotional for El Paso jurors, and, or El Pasoans in general. Mm-hmm. And it's going to take us to go through a lot of jurors to find uh, juries a jury panel mm-hmm. willing to hear the case in order to be qualified to be a juror uh, the jury doesn't have to be completely immune to Walmart uh, what they have to do is they have to say that uh, while they may have heard of Walmart and they may have an opinion about Walmart they have to be willing to set aside whatever they have from the outside world set that aside and view the case from the 
the evidence from the right. that they're going to hear from the witness stand and view his guilt or not guilt from the witness stand, make their decision regarding guilt and not guilt solely from the witness stand. And then if, if he's found guilty, we go to the punishment case. And in the punishment case, they have to decide uh, that the, in a capital murder case, it's two questions. They have to answer the two questions based on the evidence solely from the witness stand. And if so, then that determines whether we go to, to death penalty or life in prison. Okay. So, now, um, the reason why we are still proceeding with a state trial is because um, I have a very deep personal conviction that with the gag order in place, I can't really talk about the, the reasons, the, the, the facts of the case, right? But the public doesn't know what happened before the, the shooter came to El Paso. Okay. The public doesn't know what happened once he got to El Paso. The public doesn't know what happened when he went into Walmart. And the public doesn't know what happened when he left Walmart. The public will never know, truly know, what happened unless we go to trial. Okay. When we go to trial, we present all of that evidence. And it's probably going to take two or three weeks just to present all that evidence. Mm -hmm. If he pleads guilty, then the same thing that happened in federal court would happen in state court. Mm -hmm. A prosecutor stands up and reads a summary of the evidence. Mm -hmm. And that summary may be 30 minutes long. But that summary is just a summary. It's not the real presentation of the evidence. And the jury, the public still doesn't know everything that happened. Three weeks of trial in 30 minute summary, you're missing a lot. Yeah. You're missing a lot. Right. That Reader's Digest version is not going to cover everything that you really need to know. Right. So the public has a right to know though it really happened, mm -hmm. it really happened. The public has a right to know. Mm -hmm. The victims have a right to know. They don't, they don't know the facts. Mm -hmm. We haven't disclosed the whole case to the victims and the victims' families. Mm -hmm. They have a right to know. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a right mm -hmm. to know. So we get the what, what really happened, that needs to be disclosed at trial. And then when it comes time for punishment, I personally believe that a person who comes to our community and makes hunts down people based on their ethnic origin mm -hmm. uh, needs to face the death penalty. Right. But I think that's a decision that should be made by the people in our community. Mm -hmm. And the people in our community will have that voice through the jury. Okay. So whether he gets the death penalty or he gets life in prison, that should be a decision made by the jury. Okay. If it's a plea agreement, that's one person, the district attorney, saying, I believe you should have life in prison. Mm -hmm. How's that fair? Mm -hmm. How's it fair that one person makes that decision for our entire community, for all of the victims who want the death penalty, for all of the victims who want life in prison? Mm -hmm. For all of the, the community that wants the death penalty, for all of the community that wants life in prison, how is it fair that one person makes that decision? Mm -hmm. How is that fair? I, I don't think it's fair. I don't. Right. I think it should be the community through the jury that hears the evidence and makes that decision. Right. So that's why we're still going to trial okay. on a case, even though he has pled guilty in the federal system to different charges, right. same incident, but different charges. Mm -hmm and um, still facing trial. So then when we have the state, when all that process has gone through and we have the, um, um, we know what's gonna happen on the state side, it's, he has two different, um, what, what was the word I'm trying to look for? Um, sentences, mm -hmm. right. And so again, because he was borrowed from the state, he was yeah. originally in state custody the state verdict will control his fate. Okay. Okay. So if he receives life in prison, he'll receive life in prison in state custody. If he receives the death penalty, he will face the death penalty in the state. 
either way, he would he's going to go to spend his life in a state prison, okay. not the federal prison. Okay. It's um, there is some potential that we could agree to transfer him, but his his fate will be in a state prison. Okay. Um, awesome. That's excellent information, and thank you so much for sharing that with us and even and going there with me. Uh, I appreciate your time on that. Um, so we went over a lot of information today. Um, is there anything that we missed or that we want to make sure that we kind of um, just go around, remind people again, or is there anything you're looking or asking for from the community? No, I, I would appreciate the community following our, our social media pages, and and hopefully we can continue to relay information out. There is a lot of information, but that's because our criminal justice system is, it really is the backbone of our community. And if our criminal justice system isn't there to support the community, mm -hmm. it doesn't support the backbone and our community begins to fail. Yeah. So, uh, so much of our, of our community just doesn't realize how important our criminal justice system is and how important the district attorney's office mm -hmm. is to our criminal, to our, to our society and how organized and, and how our society functions. Exactly. So I really hope that our, our that your listeners will go ahead and follow our social media pages yes. and we'll pay attention to what's happening here in the county courthouse. Awesome. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. Real quick. All right, El Paso. What an amazing interview. I am super excited to get this information out to you guys. Again, if you have any questions, ask in the comments and we'll try to get those answered for you. Um, super informative watch the whole thing it's worth it i promise you this is about our community it's about your home it's about where we live our neighbors our families so watch it all spread it share it um, and make sure to follow the el paso uh, district's attorney it's el paso or ep ep district attorney on instagram and facebook all right perfect easy peasy thank you guys so much for tuning in thank you so much for going local a quick shout out to my sponsors thank you to star city studios el paso family dental viva la mocha and el paso zoo society follow them all follow everybody all these businesses i'm sharing with you is because it's important and i want you to know about them and be in the know so thank you again and we'll see you next week bye